dad's a, a great visionary and a great idea guy. There is just an infinite enthusiasm for wine. He's absolutely been ahead of everybody, thinking he reacts more quickly. He's just full of energy. He can't sit still. He's always short of time. He gambled absolutely everything because he had the commitment and the conviction of his own beliefs that he would be right. I wanted to excel in winemaking. I would stop at nothing. I'd buy the finest equipment. I would buy the finest barrels. I would do anything and everything to excel. The history of California's Napa Valley is full of transformations. Vineyards have ebbed and flowed across the valley floor here for the past 150 years. There's been boom and bust, prohibition and phylloxera. And Napa is home to America's unchallenged ambassador of wine. Admired for his vision, drive and commitment to excellence, Robert Mondavi is seen as the man who ushered wine into the modern era, certainly in California, and perhaps even the world. So I say making good wine is a skill. Fine wine, an art. Well, the more you look into this, the more you realize how complicated, and you have to watch every step from the grape growing. You have to be sure not to overproduce. You have to have the right grapes in the right location. You have to pick them at the right time. It's the same as raising a child. And if you abuse it, you're not going to get anything. And you'll have a frustrated child. You abuse winemaking, grape growing winemaking, it's the same thing. You have to understand that. And that takes complete dedication. The grape grower plays a crucial role. Without top quality grapes, there's no chance of producing fine wine. The annual dinner to honor his growers is a time for celebration, a time to evaluate this year and plan for the future. The thing that, that was so good about my father is he never looked at today. He only looked at five or 10 years from now. And that's really all that really excited him and interested him. When one asks about my father's contributions as a winemaker, I think that uh, people would automatically uh, say innovation. I wouldn't limit it to winemaking, I would say innovation. My father has a clear vision of uh, pursuing excellence, um, a clear vision to energetically um, uh, see what is available in the world, uh, whether it is in uh, 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 production or whether it's in, in marketing. And he would uh, bring those ideas yeah, back and get everyone excited. Yeah, Thank you. we should feed you like this every day. Yeah, at the scale. It's a celebration of the accomplishments in the vineyard. It's a celebration of the people working together to accomplish something that is a, is a symbol of man's harmony with nature and with each other. This is, this is teamwork. This is teamwork. Somebody up there had something to do with it, and it's fun to celebrate that with a meal. In the next five years, we'll make as much progress as we've made in the past 10 to 15 years in quality of our wine, as well as uh, in success of marketing and selling our wines worldwide. We are selling our wines internationally, and they are growing, and we are very optimistic of the future. So I want to thank all of you. It is you people, you growers, our growers, <laughs> who are actually making it possible for us to produce a wine that I claim has the gentleness of a baby's bottom, but has the power and the depth of a Pavarotti. And that's what we want to do. Thank you. It's been wonderful being with you. <laughs> a family has that, as I say, they want to excel. Generally speaking, in business like that, in order to really uh, do a better job than the corporations, they have to excel. And the family businesses who are smart realizes that they will put more, they will get more done 
than a corporation. Yes, a corporation can do a good job, but in a family type operation, they want to excel, that personalization. And that's something that everybody loves. We need more of that in the world. 419. Not 33. Writer, taster, auctioneer, and master of wine, Michael Broadbent, is hailed internationally as an influential expert on top quality wine. As the director of Christie's wine department, he travels widely, tasting the best the world has to offer. A little, just 12 bottles. Britain has been the world capital for the trade in vintage wines for over 200 years, and Christie's have been involved from the very beginning. Today, at their auction rooms in Amsterdam, over 10,000 bottles of fine and rare wine will be sold, mostly to private collectors. Although the British don't produce many wines of note themselves, their trading experience has made them world experts on fine wine. In his quest for international recognition, Mondavi realized that he would first have to win over the British wine trade. 600. At 600, anymore, at 600. Your numbers. We've sold wine for 200 years by auction, but they didn't have a specialized department. And I came along as a fully trained wine man, about the right age, uh, to, to start something out really with, a, with more expertise. And we had a, we gained a very important international uh, reputation very quickly. And it's really through this I met Robert Mondavi. And I really hadn't met him properly before. And he, because he never stopped talking, he was full of ideas, full of energy. He then got out a bottle of, um, it was Schloss Wolras, I mean, a top class estate bottle, German wine. And he opened a bottle of his own Johannesburg Riesling. And quite honestly, it was awful. And they, 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 <laughs> They didn't compare. And what is interesting, that in the space of 20 years, the whole scene is transformed. He certainly has been uh, one of the great pioneers. I gotta get all these charming up. <laughs> when you get to be old enough, when you get you to be get old anything, enough, you can do these and get away with it. That's right. You're not quite old enough yet. I can try. Right. 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 Yes, His contribution was, um, I'd say, propagating the idea that California, the Napa particularly, can make wines of, this, of very similar quality. Uh, not necessarily similar style, but similar quality, and sometimes similar style to, to the great European classics, which, frankly, everybody compares. Everybody compares their red wines to Bordeaux or to Burgundy. I had to not tell people what to do. I had to show them. They always knew that the great French uh, Bordeaux, the great uh, French Burgundy, were the greatest wines in the world. Everybody said that we couldn't produce wine belonging in that company. So I'd take about 15 of our people to Europe. I would go through France, I'd go through Italy, Switzerland, Germany, to show what was going on. Mondavi's passion has always been to collect and test out new ideas and he spent the past 30 years combing the world for them. On a trip through France in 1962, he found the old craft of barrel making very much alive. French oak barrels were still being widely used to age fine wines. Mondavi realized that while he could make wine to compare with the best in California, there was still some way to go to match the top European producers. He began to experiment with combining the old traditions of Europe with the science and technology of America. When they saw what they saw in Europe, they became convinced that we could produce wine that belonged in the company of the, what was considered the great wines of the world. Then, on a warm spring day in May 1976, the image of American wine in the eyes of the world suddenly changed forever. A group of high priests of the cult of French enology were assembled at the Hotel Intercontinental in Paris. They pitted the finest French and American wines against each other in a blind tasting. The French had the tastings of their fine, great French wines, their Bordeaux and their white Burgundies versus the Cabernet Sauvignons and the Chardonnays of Napa Valley. Well, they, the people, the Frenchmen themselves, who were either in the restaurant business or sold wine or in the wine business, 
they judged these wines. They picked out the Napa Valley Cabernet and Chardonnay as being number one. Well, that was a shock to the world. Napa Valley had captured the imagination of the wine world, and it was not for the first time. The story of Californian wine growing goes back before the time of orange groves, before the discovery of gold, when Los Angeles was just a small pueblo. From 1796 onwards, vineyards were planted throughout California by Franciscan missionaries. Sixty years later, wine was being made commercially in Napa Valley by John Patchett. And by 1861, Charles Krug, a Prussian emigrant and free thinker, had set himself up as Napa's foremost vintner. By then, Napa wines were beginning to be noticed, winning major prizes in Europe. The French realized even then that the valley might someday provide real competition. Mondavi had been associated with grapes and wine ever since his childhood. Born in 1913 in Virginia, Minnesota, his parents had emigrated three years earlier from the Marsh region of Italy. By 1921, the family had moved to California, where his father established a flourishing grape shipping business. Wine has an affinity for family. It's close to the earth. I'm lucky because basically my father at that time told me he felt that Napa Valley was the outstanding wine growing region for both red and white table wine. And that at that time, they were drinking mainly port cherry muscatel, what we call dessert wine. And he said 90% was port cherry muscatel in 35. And he felt that that would change. So you see, my father laid everything out for me. All I had to do is take advantage of it and have enough common sense to realize wine is part of the good life. And I grew up with that and I've enjoyed it ever since. My parents had wine all the time. When I was three, four years old, I began to drink wine and water. My mother fed it me in teaspoonfuls in the beginning. And it was part of our living. It was a, a liquid food. Well, to me, I never thought of abusing wine because I was, grew up with it. And unfortunately, we in America are taught we can't drink wine until we're 21 years of, of age, and then we don't know what to do with it. We have to teach our children from the time they're children up uh, until they're grown uh, how to use wine, to drink wine in moderation. In moderation, it's good for you. You abuse it, it's bad. Mondavi began his career producing bulk wine at sunny St. Helena in 1936. But he was already looking for an opportunity to get the family into the fine wine business. I knew that the Charles Krug Winery was going to be sold. Well, I went to my parents, uh, and this was on a Friday, and I went to talk to them, and I told them, Dad, we have an opportunity buying the Charles Krug Winery. And I had a plan that if we bought all the bulk wine, from Sunny St. Helena at 28 cents. And then we bottled that wine. We could sell it at a profit and pay for the winery. Well, my mother was listening in the kitchen. He said, Bob, I'm not interested in, uh, in going any further. I'm very happy. But my mother listened to the conversation. And that night we went to bed. The next morning I was trying to figure out what can I do to convince my father. As we went down for breakfast, my father said to me, and I said, good morning, Dad, and all. He said, well, when do we go to St. Helena? Well, you can understand what my mother talked about when they were in their bedroom. She was the one that was able to get him to realize that we should at least see what was going on. This wine was virtually empty all those years. It was owned by Mr. Moffat, and of course, that person is 19, in 1943, and at that time was nothing but dirt floor, a few old dilapidated tanks, and a second floor, third floor that at most was missing. And so what he had to do is remove all the old 
uh, tanks and replace it, put co concrete floors, and install all these tanks in, in, the, in, the, in the 40s. And from the time I was about three or four years old, my babysitter was the cellar master. And the winery was my jungle gym and where I played. There was such a, a sense of, uh, of mystery about the entire winemaking process. And we would go out ahead of time and, and crush the grapes, collect the samples and crush the grapes. The most vivid memory of my father at Charles Cougar are, are two. Uh, one is that he had to travel extensively and was not there. And the other was that uh, during the harvest, I would go through uh, with him on weekends especially, as he was tasting tanks of fermenting juice and as he was checking loads of grapes coming in. It was wonderful to see the grapes come in, to uh, throw them in the air, catch them. I, the first days of harvest, my shirt would be purple. <laughs> when we were together, he was always doing traveling, traveling. In other words, he, I would say he's traveled at least 50% of the time. And I'd say, and of course, all the burden here as far as the winery was over here was on my shoulders. <laughs> And the travel schedule has not much changed in all these years. Robert Mondavi and his wife, Margaret Beaver, spend more time than ever on the road. Unfortunately, we don't spend enough time at our home. Uh, we have a lovely home. We enjoy it immensely. But at the same time, we do travel overseas quite often. In fact, maybe this last year, almost 70% of the time. We want to educate the Americans, but we also want to educate the world at large that we are much more cultured than, they, than we might be perceived to be in the eyes of many people. And by doing this, we feel that we can really let the world know not only do we have guns, planes, armaments, but also we have the more cultural aspects of wine, food, music, and the arts, and we can, and we have it. All we want to do, somebody's got to go out there and let them know what we have, and that's what we're doing. He actually introduced grapes to the English. The English wine trade were not remotely con conscious of the grape varieties from which wine was made. So it was Mondavi who tells the British wine trade that um, the Bordeaux was made from Cabernet Sauvignon and so forth. The Pinot Noir was made from Burgundy. We never thought of the grape before. We just thought of, we thought of white Burgundy and white Burgundy. But now everyone knows it's made from the Chardonnay grape because Mondavi told us. <laughs> He has a real amazing amount of enthusiasm. He's also the most positive person I've ever met in my life. Uh, and this attractive, attracted me immensely to him because I am a, a sort of a, a, a digging Swiss, you know, and, and, and to find this enthusiasm was uh, so refreshing. My wife, Margaret, is a very important factor to me, to our company. She is the one that helped to add much more, a heart and soul, in our business. And that's what you need. You have someone with feeling from a cultural level. We started really from scratch. The first art show, I just gathered my friends. I do, do a little painting. I gathered my friends from the North Bay Artists Association and asked them if they would bring out some paintings and we hang them out, hung them outside on the walls and lots of people came. I realized this was successful and Bob always said yes, do something like that. I, 
built the winery for that. Later on, the vineyard room was built. This was even before the vineyard room was built. And then I asked Bob, could we try a concert? And I remember he said, if it doesn't cost anything. <laughs> and so we, we started borrowing the chairs, borrowing the stage, getting some uh, hungry musicians for very little money. And I brought my own piano and a Volkswagen bus to the winery and we started like that that really and about three four hundred people came to that first concert i think we charged two dollars and we made about five hundred dollars which we now had for seed money and also everybody was impressed <laughs> at this 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 work of course the intent and and the raison was that we should also show that art and wine really went together Mondavi's early technical success can be attributed to Andrei Chelichev, who at 92 is still a sought-after consultant. They first met in 1936. He was a young American, about 25 years of age, not married yet, and ambitious, interested, very emotional. So he impressed me as a human material rather than anything else. Audrey was very knowledgeable. He had gone to the, uh, the viticultural school in Europe. He was knowledgeable about aging wine in barrels, and he was knowledgeable about doing a lot of research work, much more so than I. I, at that time, didn't have the technical knowledge that he had. And I really went to and exposed all my ideas and my technology, my knowledge, to Mandabi willingly, without any force or without any financial business agreement. We listened to him and we carried on the research work that he wanted, and I believed in that, and so I carried on the research. We carried on cold fermentation. We aged wine in barrels uh, and different kinds of barrels. And we brought not only restoration, Renaissance territory, build what was done before, but always excelsior policy. Let's go and never stop, and never be satisfied with ourselves. So morally, philosophically, psychologically, I was very close to Rav Mandevi. Enormous progress was made in the early years of Krug. The winery introduced cold fermentation to the valley, and they invested in French oak barrels to age their premium wines. Robert began in production but took over as general manager when his brother, Peter, joined as winemaker. But the two brothers were at odds almost from the start. He was, he was eager to, to produce uh, quality wine, but at the same time, volume. And you know, you have to have the equipment to do that. In the early days, uh, I mean, we grew. We grew too fast in those early days. From a business point of view, and my father, as long as my father was living, he understood that we had to produce more volume in order to make ends meet, where my brother wanted to go slower. I would say this, that the sales was, uh, was uh, extremely demanding on the production because we did not have the facilities here to, 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 take, care, to take care of the volume that we, uh, we had. <laughs> it was a very uh, emotional period for him in dealing with his family. Uh, because he was uh, essentially thrown out of the family business. Uh, not for business reasons, but for emotional, familial reasons. After spending 23 years of his adult life building up the Charles Krug winery, Robert was ousted. This began a traumatic legal battle that was to last more than 12 years. I did a lot of the talking, and my brother did not talk as much with me, and I didn't understand a lot of what he said. We didn't communicate. This happened to my father, and it didn't just happen to my father. It also happened to me in the fact that I was told I was not welcome at the Charles Krug Winery any longer, and I could not work there. This had been a savage as a family venture, and, uh, and we just didn't want to sell out to them. It was scary. It was, um, we, my father was able to gamble everything. He gambled absolutely everything because he had the commitment and the conviction of his own beliefs that he would be right. 
We talked uh, uh, a number of days about what is it that he's going to do? What is it that I'm going to do? And I, being a young, brash, soon to be college graduate said, well, if they won't let me work at Charles Krug, no problem. I will go to work for their toughest competitors and I will do such a great job they'll just wish they had me working for them because I'm going to succeed. And my father said, well, if you're really that in interested in the business and that dedicated, I've always wanted to start a small, super premium quality winery. Why don't we see if we can get some partners and, and put it together? And I thought, my God, this is going to be wonderful. This is a great opportunity. These painful events forced Robert Mondavi to start out from scratch at the mature age of 54. With the help of architect Brian May, he began construction of the first new winery in California since Prohibition. It was conceived as a temple to wine, food, music and the arts. The center from where he spread his message that Napa wines take their place amongst the world's finest. The way to go as far as I was concerned was to produce wine that belonged in the company of the world's finest in a small Warm operation. That's exactly how we started. So. Yet as we grew and that, yet as we became aware that this wine was making headroom, I also realized in this day and age that if we wanted to carry on and my family was growing and I had more people, I had to make up my mind to either remain small, 20, 30 or 40,000 cases, or if I wanted to feed the mouths of more of my children, I'd have to get bigger. I decided that I would get larger, but never would I sacrifice what was necessary to produce the finest wine possible. Never would I I'd do that. Robert Mondavi Winery is many things, but uh, uh, we have the flexibility to pursue the greatest. So we have a greater ability to experiment on what makes great wine tick than any winery in the world that I'm aware of for top, top wine. And so I look at our size in Oakville, and I'm, and I'm pleased for every drop of it because I know that that gives us strength in our hands. When they started making Pinot Noir, they aged it in barrel for about 14 months. They decided that that wasn't enough, that there weren't, they weren't getting the kind of wine they wanted, so they went up to 24, made much worse wine. Didn't turn a hair, he went right back the other way, and now they're down to about seven to 10 months, and that's what they should be doing. When you've got somebody of their size and influence who is that willing to go any distance to improve the breed, the rest of the people in the game have to work pretty hard to keep up, and I think that's his legacy, is that he's just forced his competitors to work their backsides off. They have defied the law of gravity. In the wine business, the image is you have to be small in order to make good wine. Uh, Robert said when he went into the wine business in 65, I want to crush this many tons and make it all first-class wine. He's come very close to realizing that dream. So, in fact, to my taste, as his production has increased, so has his quality. That's defying the laws of gravity. A very serious potential problem is becoming so popular, you become commonplace. And we have the job of taking the mystery out of wine and keeping the magic, but not allowing it to become considered as a von ordinaire. And it's a very delicate tightrope or balance. Um, I think we have a long ways to go before we become too commonplace. We now produce less than 1% of the wine in America and less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of the wine in the world. We're a drop. We're nothing. One-third of the wineries in California are here. 
And so with all these players, uh, it's especially, I think, significant to think of Robert Mondavi and his impact. He is certainly the, the lion in this pack. We sell $152 million uh, of wine a year, and uh, I would say it's worth, uh, it's worth considerable money. I hate to talk about that, to be very honest with you, but it's worth a considerable amount of money. It's a very, very complicated set of companies. They have a winery here in Napa. They have one in Lodi. They own three others. When you start trying to put all those pieces together, you drive yourself crazy. I'd say if you just took the Napa winery all by itself, forget the vineyards, forget everything else, you'd probably be looking at about $250 million. After that, maybe double, maybe triple, I don't know. They look at the almighty dollar. We are, we are all striving to achieve a goal. We don't look at how we can work with each other. We all, we, we feel that if we can make our money in five to seven years, that's it. They don't have the long range point of view. They look at making money and that is it. There's much more to it than just making money. And uh, the wine business is just the opposite of the American business. The American business wants to do things quickly, turnover and all that. The wine business is the long term business. Mondavi believes that fine wine and great food must be enjoyed together if either is to be fully appreciated. The many dinners hosted by the winery help to spread the word. Moonlight and love songs never out of day Hearts filled with passion, jealousy Woman needs man, and man must have his mate. On that you can rely. It's still the same old story. A fight for love and glory. A case of do or die. I heard three people talking about how you were talking with your hands. <laughs> As time goes by. Wine is, is romantic. The, you smell it and you have, you can describe bouquets from roses, violets, truffles, earthy, you know, so many nuances there. And then the taste again, where you have excitement in those differences. Nice party. No, I haven't seen her yet. Oh, don't worry, I, I remember what to play. It helps the digestion. The tannin and the acidity cleans the mouth. The acidity makes it refreshing. And you're dying to have something else to eat. It's terribly useful. <laughs> well, first of all, I pick the wines after the chef has selected the menu. Uh, and I don't go to the chef and say, I'm going to serve these wines, you create the meal, because I want the chef to be able to pick the best ingredients that are for that season. We're having an assortment of uh, Moroccan salads. Okay, with our first course, we're su serving Fumé Blanc, which is a Sauvignon Blanc or a Loire Valley wine. And then uh, lamb loin marinated in pomegranate juice and a couscous risotto. We felt that a Burgundian-style wine, or Pinot Noir, and we have two vintages, a 1981 and a 1990, would show very interestingly the increase stylistically of the wines. And blood orange sorbet in a chocolate cup. And then dessert, we have what I call a fun wine. And the fun wine is a Moscato d'Oro. A fight for love and glory, a case of two. Die. The world will always welcome lovers as time goes by. For a couple of periods where the, the industry 
had some ups and downs, and in 1974, uh, we almost uh, went bankrupt. Uh, we lost a great deal of money in that one year, and uh, I literally had to go to the distributors and ask them to give us some monies now for wine we would ship in the future. And there were times when Dad and I'd talk, and I'd say, Dad, we've got to worry about today. We've got to worry about surviving next month. We can't just be thinking about the future. And he said, well, we've got to do both. And the one key thing that you learn from that is you never, ever sacrifice quality. Because if you do, you destroy your future. When I uh, started the winery, we bought grapes from our growers, and there are some of the growers that had Sauvignon Blanc. And this was in 66. Well, I knew that the Sauvignon Blancs on the market were either oxidized or sweet, and they weren't highly regarded. And I didn't want to come out with a Sauvignon Blanc. So I tried to think of a name that I, I wouldn't call it Sauvignon Blanc, and then I knew that the Blanc, and I couldn't think of a good proprietary name. But I did know that the uh, Blanc Fumé of the Loire was made from the Sauvignon Blanc grape. So I decided to reverse the names. Instead of Blanc Fumé, call it Fumé Blanc. I Americanized the word. And then I took these, the Sauvignon Blanc grape, and I aged it in barrels. I made it dry. And when I put it on the market and, and call it Fumé Blanc, it took off immediately. The sales focus now is on the rest of the world. The winery is hosting its annual get-together of international distributors, this year at Birkenstock in Switzerland. Mondavi feels that American wines still suffer from a considerable amount of prejudice. The theme for this three-day event is breaking down barriers. The marketing is very important because we sell two things. We sell the quality of the liquid in the glass and the quality of the image that people believe of the wine. And you must do the best for both the quality of the liquid and the quality of the image. You look too good. Good to see you again. You, know, you should take your coat and uh, uh, your they coat off. They force me at home to wear a tie. <laughs> well, and whenever I go out like this, the people don't recognize me anymore. In what was originally a largely European-dominated market, Montavi succeeded in popularizing Californian wine and new styles. Without spending a cent on consumer advertising, the winery has become a household name in America. And by exporting to over 40 different countries, Mondavi wine is now well on its way to becoming a brand appreciated worldwide. The thing that I admire most of the moment is he's courageous and saying that um, wine is good for you. And he's being very rude about the very dangerous anti-alcohol lobby in the States. It's pretty bad in England, too. It's a very dangerous thing. I mean, next to no time, we'll find that all these minority people are pushing in prohibition, which, of course, was disastrous. The neo-prohibitionists began to say that wine was dangerous and a hazard to our way of life. And unfortunately, I was trying to get our wine institute to try to counteract this but they wouldn't do it because they were afraid of product liability lawsuits. In other words, the large wineries felt, especially the large ones, if they sue anybody, who's they going to sue? They're going to sue the large wineries, and their attorneys have been telling them, don't say anything. Don't say that wine is good for you. Don't counteract it, because otherwise you can be sued. So therefore, I've taken upon myself that we should undertake a wine industry program in which we would educate the people for what wine really is. I say it's the temperate, it's a civilized, sacred, romantic mealtime beverage that has been recommended in the Bible. It's a liquid food that is embraced and civilization well, started. Good everyone. So Welcome to Robert Manavi Winery. Bye. My name is Susan, and if you have questions as we go, please feel free to ask. We're still family owned and operated. Uh, Mr. Mandavi just turned 79 a few months ago, one of those amazingly active, vital people for that age. He recently has stepped down as being head of the company. He wants his children to take over. They've been involved through the years. The eldest, Michael, is president of the company. His brother, Tim, is the winemaker here. 
The mission program, as it was called, was launched against the advice of company lawyers, but Mondavi went ahead anyway, putting over $500,000 into researching the history of wine. Education has always been a top priority. He was the first in California to introduce free tours and tastings. But one thing still sticks in Mondavi's throat. He's forced to display a little red notice warning people that alcohol can cause birth defects and is a known carcinogen. I think that health warning, I think it's awful. I think it tells one side of the story, not the full story. We should also say that you can save that the American people, if you drink one or two glasses of wine, from 25 to 40 percent less heart attacks. We have a million heart attacks to get today in this, in this country. If they drank consistently a glass or two of wine, they would have close to 40 percent less heart attacks. That would be about 400,000 people that would be still living and having a good time. Now, to me, we don't tell that full story, and we think that's wrong. Opus One, I believe, is successful because two great winemaking families, Baron Philippe de Rothschild and Robert Mondavi, came together in a 50-50 joint venture partnership to combine the art and the tradition of Bordeaux with the science and technology of Napa. The $10 million facility originated out of a deal worked up during a one-hour discussion between Mondavi and Baron Philippe which was held informally in the Baron's bedroom. The wine is pampered throughout its whole development, transferred here between barrels by gravity feed because pumps would create too much disturbance. Opus is terrific. It's fun in the sense that it allows us to see behind the green door into Bordeaux uh, in a top, top way, and then to be able to bring ideas of that type here, for us to bring ideas of Napa Valley to Bordeaux and together produce something outstanding here in Napa Valley. I looked at him, and he looked at me. We both knew we were telling the truth, and we both knew we wanted to excel. So we were like two peas in a pod. We, we, we saw everything alike. I never had a better relationship with anyone. We've been to, uh, in business almost 12 years, and during that entire time, the arra arrangement we made in that bedroom has been maintained. Why? because our philosophy of excelling, knowing that we could produce outstanding wine here, belonging in the company of the great wines of the world, we saw eye to eye on that, and we had a wonderful relationship. A lot of people believe that it was a marketing coup between Baron Philippe de Rothschild, who really forced Bordeaux to bottle at the chateaus, and who also introduced Mouton Cadet, a very uh, broad, future-thinking man and my father, similar in this country, were getting together from a marketing perspective. And the interesting thing is, they weren't. They were saying, we think we can create something here in a wine that no one has done. And then with our marketing expertise, we can, we can promote it properly. I've always felt you needed a home. When I built our wine, we needed a home to be authentic, to be real, and I wanted something unique. What the Baron does in France is unique. What we do here, we wanted to put our two ideas, we wanted to be unique and different. That is what makes it interesting, and that gives us great satisfaction. Maybe we have to satisfy our egos, you know what I mean? We, but we want to be that way, uh, and this is what makes things life interesting.
The Napa Valley Wine Auction is one of the social highlights of the year. Also a Mondavi initiative, the event will raise over a million dollars for local health care. Robert Mondavi is not on his own in the Californian wine industry, but he has become its mouthpiece and the main catalyst for change. Had Mondavi been an Englishman with an English industry, um, he would have certainly been recognized in the Queen's Honours List or the Birthday Honours List. Uh, at least a knighthood, and you know, you would have been Lord Mondavi because he's done an immense amount for other people. Where is it? 550, 600, 4,900 left for 477. At 2,500, who's going to go on to that? At 3,005, 3,000 here, 4,000, 4,200. Oh. 8,000, 5, 9,000, 5, 10,000. At 35, last chance, 35,000. It's a, it is paradise, actually, what, what we've been doing during the last half a century. What we did in half a century, it was centuries work done in Europe. I'm 79 years of age. I've been in my business 55 years. We are now beginning to plant our grapes. Uh, uh, in um, uh, a fashion that we can get stress our grapes to get more character in our grapes. We are now realizing the importance of not bruising our grapes and handling them tenderly. It's just that simple. And there's so much we can do. And there, we'll make far better wine in the next five years, next 10 years. We have learned a lot. We are just getting started. Robert is, uh, has a, an energy level that is almost superhuman. Uh, the kids are both very bright, very talented. They're going to have to have that same degree of dedication because uh, two things, the track is faster and there are a lot more horses on it. Very hard to maintain position. Michelangelo once said that uh, one can have great vision by standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, I like that because I've got to stand on, on great shoulders. And it doesn't mean that uh, uh, my brother or I need to be a gigantic proportion, but uh, fortunately our, our, uh, uh, our father is, and as a result we can have great vision by standing on this great uh, pedestal. What I love is that I'm able to pass something over to my children that will give them a good life, that will give their grandchildren the opportunity to go into what I consider a good life. I think the wine business has something great to offer a family. You are close to the soil. You meet people who love the good life the world over. I don't care where you go in the world. You meet people who are wine growers. You'll find good people. They eat well. They like the good life. Wine, food, music, and the arts. What are we living for?